Hello and welcome to the Proyaki Report, Season 1, Episode 21, 85th Koshian Invitational Wrap-Up. I'm Michael Westbay, your host. This week, I sit down with Edwin Dizon from goroshigeno.blogspot.com to discuss this past spring's big high school Koshian tournament. We mainly discuss the Final Four, and we also delve into his general impressions of those who made it and those who didn't. I hope you enjoy the interview. Hey, we've got something special for you this week on the Pro Yaku Report. We've got Edwin Dizon, the Koshian Specialist. How's it going, Edwin? It's going all right, West Bay. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. Um, what we want to do is we want to talk about the basically the last couple of days of the 85th Koshian Invitational Tournament that happened last spring. You up for it? Sure, ready to go. Ready to go. Okay, so there were a few surprises going into the semifinal round, which had um, Suruga Ke Kehi from Fukui versus Saitama's Urawa Gakuin for the first game, and the uh, two Shikoku League teams, Kochi from Kochi, and Saibi from Ehime. Anything really stand out to you about uh, these four teams? Actually, quite a bit, in my opinion, mostly because I just wasn't necessarily expecting it. Um, I guess starting from the first quadrant and uh, Suruga Kehi out of Fukui, um, I guess the biggest thing for me was the fact that, you know, they did not necessarily look that strong in the fall Hokushinetsu Super Regional, losing to a first-time winner in Harue Kogyo. Um, uh -huh. Not to mention that in their draw for Harue Koshien, they ended up drawing one of the extra games because they expanded the field uh -huh. this year. Um, but then they come out and completely wipe the floor against uh, Okinawa Shogaku, which was a big surprise. Uh -huh. And then they face a another first timer in Kyoto Shoe and basically and they hold on for a six to five win, but they managed to defeat two super regional champions. So in of itself with just with those first two games, um Suruga Kehi basically surprised me and I think a lot of other teams on their performance. Uh-huh. And Urawa Gakuin? Um, Urawa Gakuin was a team that I just never really bought into. Um mainly because their ace Ojima just did not look like a you know a dominant typical ace, ace. <laughs> well uh, well he's a he, well actually he was a typical ace he wasn't one of those dominating aces like you would see with you know we'll talk later with Anraku out of Saibi for instance or uh -huh. you know back in the day when you had uh, Yosuke Shimabukuro for instance um you know he he looked like an average ace he only threw in the high 130s he didn't really command a lot of strikeouts, and so I just figured as the tournament went along that at some point, you know, this will all catch up to him, and it just never did. So he basically relied a great deal on his defense more so than just striking out batters. Yeah, I mean, he did end up with a couple with a game or two where he, he did strike out a lot of batters, but for the most part, he really did depend on his defense to actually get him through the games, which was, like I said, something you wouldn't necessarily see from a title contender necessarily. All right, and the uh, two Shikoku League teams. Right. Um, on the other quadrant, or the other and uh, the other half, um, you you had uh, Kochi in the upper right hand quadrant, and um, realistically, I you know I didn't really see them getting out of the first game, but that might just be my own little bias <laughs> with Kanze, because I thought Kanze had a good team back in 2011, and it looked like they possibly had reloaded for this year. Uh -huh. Where would you have ranked uh, Kanze in uh, the overall ranking? Kanze probably, the way they look like, seem like a, a a possible title contender. Not necessarily one of the favorites, but definitely 
somebody that you could consider. At least that was, that's what it was in my opinion. But you know, after seeing how they played against Kochi, it uh, it was rather surprising. And um, Kochi basically just continued from that upset. Uh, and then you know, after a somewhat of a, you know a, a, a brief game against. Uh, uh, Tokohaki Gogawa, then they went on to face the um, Meiji Jingu champions uh, Sendai Ikue, who up until that point also had not impressed me that much either. And mm -hmm. when they shut them out two to nothing, that I think that's when you really had to consider them as a possible title contender, although by that time they were in the semifinals. So they were kind of like uh, Tsudaga Kehi in the fact that they had some really tough matches early on, and they really got through them. Yeah, um, although with, you know, with Suru Kehi, I mean, they, they really showed it because of the fact that they beat two super regional champions. Um, you know, admit it, now they, uh, Kochi did beat Kanze, but I think it was, I, I think that even though they defeated the Meiji Jujinku champions in Sendai Ikue, because of their poor performance earlier, um, I probably would have given more credit to Suga Kehi than possibly uh -huh. uh, to Kochi. Although both of them, in their own ways, really proved that they, you know, they actually did belong in the semifinals. Uh -huh. um, and then finally, and, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, just going on to Saibi with uh, their ace Annaku. Right, and you know the the last part, uh, the last team was probably the team that probably was the least surprise, I guess if you put it <laughs> that way. In Saibi, um, you know, admittedly down in the lower in that in that quadrant there, you would have looked at Osaka Towing and considered them probably the fav one of the better contenders, but injuries just piled up on them, and they ended up falling to Kenritsuki Fushogyo. Um, and unfortunately for Kenrizu Gifushogyo or Ken Gifusho, um, they ended up suffering their own injuries, which probably hindered them in their quarterfinal game against Saibi. Uh, uh -huh. That's nothing. To, that's nothing to take away from Saibi and what Anaku had been doing. But you looked at their quarterfinal game against Kenrizu Gifushogyo. It was obvious that um, his first game, the extra inning affair against uh, Koryo had taken a bit of a toll on him as he did not look sharp for about half the game in the quarterfinals. Uh -huh. but, and uh, he threw 200-plus pitches that one game? Right, yeah, that was an extra inning affair against uh, Corio, which apparently made a lot of headlines where, uh -huh. you know, he, you know the, he, he won the game for the team, but, I mean, it was, it was definitely a, a hard-fought affair for him. And... Um, you know, 13 innings and definitely took its toll on him in the latter stages of the tournament, especially in the finals. Okay. And uh, just going through the games really quick, um, Ura Urawa Gakuin beat uh, Tsudaga Kehi by a score of 5-1. to one. Um, Saibi defeated Kochi, what was it, 3-2? to two? That right. seemed like a close game. Yeah, and I mean, uh, Anraku was, uh, I, in some ways, a, a bit back on his game in the in the semifinals. He did give up the early run to Kochi in the first inning, but um, you know he kept his team in it and allowed his offense to eventually catch up and uh, get the go ahead run in the bottom of the eighth inning, uh -huh. just in time, really. He, uh... Yeah, he he started off throwing a lot of breaking pitches in that game, and eventually got up to about 145 around the fourth fifth inning. Um, but it was a seesaw game, and really, more than Anaku, the hero seemed to be Yamashita. Yeah, I mean he he was what two for three in the game with uh, two runs, uh, two RBIs, and. Uh, had that uh and definitely was a lot a big part of the offense for uh Saibi in the semi in the semifinals. Could you could you say he was all of the offense? <laughs> I, it wasn't all the offense because he had two RBIs, but he and he scored yes. two of the runs. So not <laughs> quite. But I mean definitely the home run in the eighth was was uh 
uh, was a way to pick up Anuraku, so he didn't have to necessarily pitch more than nine innings because he certainly <laughs> had he certainly had done a lot up until that point. Okay, yes, the home run in the eighth inning was the game winner, and so Saibi went on to their first final ever, wasn't it? Um, I know that it was Urawa Gakuin's uh, first final. Uh, Urawa um, Gakuin, that's right. Yeah, I think Saibi had actually... Uh, Saibi had won it all in spring of 2004. Yeah, that's I right. mean, yeah, yeah, they... they it was interesting because Saibi hadn't really been to a lot of Koshian tournaments, but out of the five that they had been to, uh, summer and spring combined, uh, they had actually reached the finals in three out of the five, which I think is one of the higher rates out there in terms of <laughs> reaching the finals. And weren't all of them in the 2000s? Yes. Um, they reached the finals in uh, summer and spring finals in 2004, prior uh -huh. to reaching the spring final here in 2013. So would you have said that Saibi was probably the uh, um, um, favorite going into the final or was Urawa Gakuin? It, it was hard to say I think in my opinion because I think by the finals I had to I had to give Ojima credit. I mean there's just no ways to get around it. You reach the finals and you have to you have to be good as a pitcher in some way or another, despite the appearances compared to what I think an, you know a dominant day should be, right? Well, um, there's all kinds of things going on before the tournament, but it's really what you do in the tournament that counts. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, just all the signs usually would point to the fact that he wouldn't necessarily be a pitcher that would lead him to the finals, but he got them to the finals, so you have to give him credit for that. On the other side, um, over with Saibi and Anraku, I mean, I think really the game just hinged on whether Anraku would have anything left in the tank. Because if he didn't, then Saibu was pretty much out of luck. Um, I I didn't seem like that uh, Ojima had any of the same issues, so it really just hinged on how Anraku did in the finals. Yeah, well, you you say out of luck, but when I first heard Anraku's name, I kept hearing the announcer basically saying, unlucky, unlucky, and that's... What I thought his name was at first. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly is an interesting last name, but yeah, well, so but uh, he he turned out to be very unlucky in this final as uh, he ran out of gas midway through, and Saibi's relief core didn't really help. No, um, you know you. you... It's kind of expected once you get past the ace pitcher in most cases. Once Anraku ran out of gas in the fifth and they had to turn to their relief core, it just it just wasn't uh, all that good. And you know, uh, you never want to see a blowout in the final because it seems anticlimactic and all. But yes, um, you know, seventeen to one loss, and that's pretty much it. And that's all she wrote. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that uh, Saibi versus Kochi. Um, semi-final, that was an exciting uh, back-and-forth seesaw game, whereas the blowout in the final, 17-1 to 1 was the final, and it really did seem anticlimactic. It did, um, but again, it was something that was a realistic outcome, just given the fact that Anraku had the 13 inning game in the first game, and then you saw him struggle in the quarterfinals against Kenry Tsugifu Shogyo. And then, you know, you just saw the, I don't know if it was planned because of just facing the opposing opposition and what they were huh. weak against, but the fact that he tried to, you know, take it easy in the first couple innings and then ramp it up in the second half, you knew that they were trying to somehow get him to the finals and hopefully uh -huh. keep him with enough gas that he'd be able to pitch through the finals against Urawa Gakuin, and that just never happened. Yeah, and uh, that was unfortunate. But, you know, there were a lot of other games. Was there any particular game that really stood out to you? I don't know if it was any particular games necessarily, just more of the tournament more as a performance. whole. performance? Um, you know, it, it, there were... There were a lot of teams out there that, you know, were, you know, again, with matchups that provided teams with an opportunity to get their first win because both of them had just been there for their first time or maybe they uh -huh. just lost games and whatnot. Um, 
you know, so definitely with the way the draw turned out being very even, it was definitely in, uh, a lot more interesting to see, in, in my opinion. Um, in terms of individual teams, I mean, one team I was just kind of impressed with just because of the the style that they played, and I think they were more consistent to who they were, was uh, Soseikon out of uh, Nagasaki. Uh -huh. um, they ended up drawing the Meiji Jingu champion, Sendai Ikue, in the first round. <laughs> Um, and while they lost seven to two, um, uh -huh. they definitely had their own style of playing where um, they knew that they were not a power hitting team, that they were basically a slap hitting baseball club and scrappy you saw, team. You, and you basically saw them, you know, showing more of the bust and run type mentality that, um, you know, I kind of wish other uh, they did more than just necessarily the bunting. But uh -huh. I mean, they would they'd show bunt, pull it back, and just slap the ball over the place, which, you know, given that they know that they're probably not a power-hitting team, it, 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 it was something that impressed me in the sense that they just stuck to what they did to get them there, and it was something that was different than what you saw from a lot of the other teams out there. Uh-huh. So um, uh, we did get some variety and uh, some different techniques. We saw aces like Unnaku, even though he came unhinged in the end, um, not living up to the hype that uh, Matsuzaka had set back in 1998. You know, and, it, and I guess another team I'd probably want to mention would be, and I don't, I don't want to forget this team because I think, you know, they ended up getting looked over just because they lost was Kenry Zagifu Shogyo. They oh, did yeah. lose. They did lose to Saibi 6-3 in the final in the quarterfinals, but if not for the injuries sustained to their battery in Fujita uh -huh. and Koyama, I, I really think that they, we may not actually have seen Saibi in the semifinals because Anraku did not look very sharp in that game, and um, Kenry Zugifu Shogyo actually held a 3-2 lead in the late stages of the game, but uh -huh. Fujita could only go, um, I believe it was five innings, and so he, they, they had to go to the relief core, and unfortunately, usually when that happens, yes. <laughs> not most times not good things happen, and it, and it it came unhinged for them in the later stages. But if they weren't injured, I would actually have given Kenry Zagifu Shogyo a shot, um, at least to, you know, at, you know, at least to reach the semifinals, if not further. I don't know how they would have done against Rawagakuin, but. I think that they're actually a team that you might want to watch out for, so long as you know the injuries uh -huh. sustained weren't severe. Uh huh. So uh, yeah, that is a very good wrap up of a lot of the teams. Um, what happened in the end? And I'd like to thank you for joining me and uh, giving this roundup. Oh yeah, no problem. Glad to help. And uh, please plug your blog. Um, oh. about uh, high school baseball. Oh, right. Um, as you can see from my little header there, or footer there, um, I kind of named it after one of the uh, anime characters, uh, Goro Shigeno out of Major. So it's uh, gorosigeno.blogspot.com. Uh, there's usually a lot of coverage on the tournaments itself. I try to write um, during uh, the, the summer qualifying or the qualifiers, fall type yeah. of Qualifiers or the fall tie guys. Um, I will. I'm trying to write more, uh, you know, outside of those, just on general articles and whatnot. But for the most part, if you're looking for game coverage and tournament coverage, that's where you can go. And it is an excellent site. They, you have got the largest collection of high school um, baseball game recaps that is out there in any language. It is an absolute treasure trove for those interested in learning more about high school baseball, um, how it is it actually works, as we had discussed on our previous uh, podcast with you. And I'd like to thank you for all the excellent work you do. No problem. I mean, I it was, you know, Coco Yaku is something that I definitely love, and I want to bring to people outside of Japan. So uh, anyway, anything I can do to help people understand the game and understand how everything works, all the better. All right. Thank you very much. And we're going to call it quits. Catch you right. later. Thank, thank you very much, Michael. And now it's time for the Pocket Calendar. 
The Central League teams head over to Pacific home parks this week for interleague. So far, the Central League has won 14 and lost 10 of the first 24 interleague games. We'll see if the home field advantage gives the Pacific League any step up this coming week. Also coming up this week, on Monday, May 20th, is this week's Japan Baseball Weekly Podcast. It'll feature an interview with the Giants' Jose Lopez, after which there will be some discussion about interleague play, home plate collisions, and more. Be sure to tune in via John's JapaneseBaseball.com homepage, via the iTunes Store, or other RSS music subscription services. You'll be glad you did. If you know of any upcoming pro related events, would like me to perhaps research something for a report topic, or even hang out in a future report, please leave a comment below on either the Google Plus pro community or the Bayside West Yokohama blog at JapaneseBaseball.com. I'll definitely see your comment in those places. You can also contact me via email at westbaystars at mark japanesebaseball.com if you'd prefer to make arrangements in private. And with that, I submit to you this week's ProYaku Report. Thank you for joining me. Until next week, take care.